When someone says the name Lanny for Terry, probably the first thing I think of is greatness. He had one of the great voices of all time for baseball. One of the best baseball announcers I've ever heard. While Lanny was an amazing broadcaster, he also has been an amazing teacher, mentor, and friend. Lanny, if I had a vote, you'd be in Cooperstown. It was difficult because it involved a lot of travel. It involved a lot of time away from the family. You know, and he was gone for half of the baseball season. And so our time with him was limited. If I had ever had the opportunity to take a class where Lanny Terry was teaching me broadcasting, I would have jumped at that chance. And a one ball pitch. Giles swings, drive to right field. Buckles win by way of a grand slam. Brian Giles, a line drive, grand slam into the right field seats. Hires broadcaster who would do anything for anyone. No job was beneath Lanny. He would do anything he could to make us better. He would work with colleagues in any way imaginable. And he was going to make sure that students would have a great experience. I'm not a pirate broadcaster without him. How grateful you have to be that he's there. You, yeah, people like Lanny for Terry don't come around very often. Uh, you know, we've been friends for some almost 35 years now, so, and still are to this day. What is the word that Lanny first teaches us in class that's hanging in Miller Hall? Knowledge. 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 Facts, information, and skills acquired by a person through experience or education. Lanny for Terry was the middle child in a typical household. As Lanny does in most situations to this day, he made the most of it. I was a very insecure child, so I had a lot of questions about life. When you have an older brother who's like the, you know, the big guy, the older brother, uh, the, the number one son, and then you have a younger sister, you know, she's the princess. And um, but I also have found out over the years, it's my belief that the, the the middle child is very often more creative, more career driven. Uh, but I used to kid my parents about how, how I suffered because I was the middle child. Like his two children are with him, Lanny was very close with his father, Albert. My dad was, was a busy man, particularly when I was 13, 14, 15. Uh, he, he was busy running a bowling center, and so he wasn't around an awful lot. But um, uh, when we were together, it was... Uh, an opportunity for us to, to share a lot of ideas. He lived in Rochester, New York, and um, you know he would come see us. And he uh, he pitched horseshoes, so he would like travel you know around the country like pitching horseshoes, which was pretty cool. Even though he was in Rochester, uh, my grandfather would drive down to Pittsburgh numerous times, and he would come out to the ballpark. Uh, he would come down to spring trainings. Uh, he would try and spend as much time as he could because I know how proud he was of my father uh, in what he had become. And, and a lot of what my father had become or has become is because of you know, the, the, the values instilled in him by, by my grandfather. My personality is, um, is similar to my dad. Even though I was an insecure person, I did learn by watching my dad. Um, I, I learned a lot about how to interface with people and, and, and being gregarious and caring about people. Uh, you know, the great thing about my dad was my dad didn't tell me how to live my life. He showed me how to live my life. I miss him a great deal. In October of 1996, Albert Frateri passed away at the age of 80. It was really hard. Yeah, it was really, really hard. I can't imagine what it's like to lose your father. And, you know, for him, I know he, you know, looked up to my grandfather. He was a really, a really good man. I know my dad really looked up to him, still does, you know? So I think, yeah, I know it was really hard for him. My grandfather had always kind of been my father's support system. Uh, you know, my dad would get up to Rochester quite a bit, 
to see him when my grandfather wasn't coming down to Pittsburgh. Uh, and they were very close. And I think a lot of the things that, you know, he learned in life, he got from, from his father. Uh, and he was a constant. We would see him a lot. And, and he was there. And so it was difficult when, when he passed. After he died, by the way, I, uh, I went to a tattoo parlor and had my dad's initials put on my shoulder. Um, it, I, as I say, I miss him a lot. Early in my life, around 12 or 13, I wanted to be a baseball announcer. And so when, when we would go to my brother's games, uh, my brother's four years older than I am, when we go to his game, my, my dad would park the car so that I could sit in the front seat of the car and announce the game. And, um, and so I spent a lot of time, 13, 14, 15, practicing my baseball play-by-play -play because that's what I wanted to be as a baseball announcer. I also created a card game. An ace of hearts was a home run, uh, two was a base, a single, or a seven could be a fly out to left field, an eight could be a fly out to center field. And then when I got into high school, I, I, uh, I, I played sports. I played football, basketball, and baseball, but I wasn't a very good athlete. You know, I, I used to hear about his, his sports experiences in high school and college, and you know, he wasn't really that athletic. So to see him um, have a passion for baseball, uh, having not really had success in it as a student, uh, was interesting to see. The, the head coach of the football team was also the swim coach. And uh, George Graham uh, came to me and said, hey, I, I, I'd like to have a, an announcer for the swim meets. And so I started doing the announcing. And, and it was the first opportunity for me to feel the, the power that announcers have, because in swimming, the, the swimmers didn't get up on the blocks until you announced their names. And then also at our, at our pool in high school, we didn't have a scoreboard. And so I had to announce the results of all the meets. First opportunity to, to feel the power of being an announcer. And also in high school, we didn't have an intercom system. So we used to have assemblies every other week and someone needed to do the announcements at assemblies and, and I was the one that the, the teachers chose to do that. In maybe an odd form of foreshadowing, Lanny always preferred a smaller school, similar to where he is today. I did not want to be involved in fraternities and sororities. I didn't, I didn't want to have to join a fraternity. And when I visited Ithaca, I noticed that the campus really centered around the student union. And there were, the, the, the fraternities that were at Ithaca were, it wasn't a big deal. And, and I was determined that when I got to Ithaca, I really wanted to get on the air as quickly as possible. And there were auditions um, right off the bat for freshmen. And only, only two or three freshmen were given radio shows um, as freshmen. And so it was a first opportunity for me to compete against other individuals, my fellow classmates, and to my first opportunity to, to have success. Uh, it gave me an opportunity to, to not only learn a lot about announcing, but getting over some of the nervousness of being in front of people and, and doing a good job, an effective job on the air. I'm not a sports fan. I'm a fan of broadcasting. For me to enjoy a sporting event, I have to be actively involved. I love putting on the headsets. I love the preparation for the game. And I don't care whether it's they pay me 50 bucks or $250 or $1,000 to do the game. I'm gonna do the same preparation I need to do for no matter what the assignment is and I love it. If you want to be considered a professional broadcaster and, and have some credibility, you have to. It's just a matter of how much you do it and, and how you do it. And, and that's, again, that's something that, that I think you are constantly going through. I had two years at WBBF in Rochester doing midnight to 6 a.m. Saturdays and Sundays. And I did that throughout college, and it was every Friday I would get on a bus and drive home to, or ride back to Rochester. And then I would come back on Sunday to campus. And then when I got out of Ithaca, um, they gave me a full-time job um, doing some all nights and then eventually 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. And I did that after graduation for four years, but um, um, I, was, I was frustrated as a disc jockey. I never thought that I was very, 
creative as a disc jockey. Plus, in the back of my mind, I had this, this obsession with wanting to be a baseball announcer. And so and I finally made up my mind that it was time to stop being a disc jockey and do what I could to become a baseball announcer. The great thing was that I went to, initially I broke away from, from WBBF and, and went to Charleston, West Virginia to be the baseball announcer. And the reason I got the baseball job in Charleston was that a guy named Carl Steinfeld, who had been the general manager of the Rochester Red Wings, and I did PA for the Rochester Red Wings while I was still a disc jockey. And so when Carl went from Rochester to Charleston, he asked me if I'd go with him. It's challenging to be a broadcaster. It is, it is challenging to pursue this dream because there are a lot of obstacles. You know, sometimes the hours aren't great. You're working a lot of weekends. You're trying to balance your work-life relationships, right? You're trying to balance uh, mental health and, and wellness. You also typically don't get paid very well uh, when, you, when you start out in broadcasting. Uh, and, you know, you start out just like anyone in any industry at the very bottom of the totem pole. You know, I think the struggles are many, and to this day, I still struggle. There were challenges, little money. My wife stayed in Rochester for much of that summer, and so I was alone, and because I didn't make much money, the only thing I could afford to do was I, I was able to line up a, a dormitory room. I had a radio, and I didn't have a telephone. I, you know, I had a car, so my life was basically baseball in the dormitory. Lanny would meet one of the most influential figures in Pirates history that first summer in Charleston. Steve threw out almost every one of the games he started. He'd be knocked out in the second inning. And so at one point he said to Steve Demeter, our manager, hey, would you mind if I, after I get knocked out of a game, if I went up and broadcast with Lanny? I was at the point, you know, I was over 30. I thought, okay, what's going to happen after baseball? And uh, I, I, th I I was looking forward to maybe trying to get into broadcasting ball games. Wow, what a great throw for me it was. To, here's a major league, a World Series star. You know, matter of fact, there are those that believe that in 1971, when Steve pitched two complete games, there are those that believe, including myself, having gone back and looked at the history, Steve Blass probably should have been the MVP of the 71 World Series with the two, two complete games. So it was really interesting to go up and sit with him, and uh, it helped me get a feel for, uh, what, for what he did and an appreciation for what he did. And one decision could have changed Pittsburgh sports forever. The, the two finalists for the pirate job after Milo Hamilton had been hired for the number one job, the two finalists for the number two job with the Pittsburgh Pirates were Mike Lang and myself. And it, it turned out that they, they chose me and what a great break it was for me to become a Pirate broadcaster, to realize my dream of being a major league announcer and then living that dream for 33 years. When I, when I went to Pittsburgh and spent two nights with Bob Prince and Nellie King, Bob Prince put me on the air to do an inning of play-by-play. -play. And Bob had a lot of complimentary things to say to me about my inning of play-by-play. -play. And so that's when I started really thinking about, you know, maybe I can, can make this happen and can make it to the major leagues. Opening night in Pittsburgh, one ball and two strikes. On Tim Wallach, the Pirates in front, two to nothing. Mason checks the runner at second. Here's the pitch to the plate. Wallach, it's a fly ball to center field. Vance Slyke has plenty of real estate to make the catch and end the game. Needless to say, the Buccos made the right call, hiring for Terry. Yeah. Bell swing to the ground, ball and a base hit into left field. See Celeste sprinting for the plate, he scores, and the Pirates win it. The Buccos defeat the Montreal Expos in the bottom of the 13th inning. I remember being so nervous, my knees were shaking, but I remember also him putting me at ease. Uh, asking me questions of myself, you know, where I was from, how old I was, and as he signed that autograph, and he gave it back to me, and, and he walked away, I thought this was one of the coolest moments of my life. You know, I've, heck, I was getting autographs of the greatest Hall of Famers. Uh, I used to come up once a year to Pittsburgh and, and, and hang out, and I collected autographs of, of Hank Aaron and Pete Rose and uh, Roberto Clemente and Willie Mays, and those were very special to me, but as special was getting the autograph of Lanny for Terry. And apparently, what Pirates fans heard was 100% authentic. He tried to always convey the same, you know, 
ethics, values, morals to, to, to us as you know, my sister and I as he would have to the, to the folks and the fans that he spoke to. He was always the one like organizing um, games. He was all, he always still is, you know, when we were growing up with the kids in the neighborhood, like, you know, wiffle ball games, softball games, um, charades, and even now, like he loves that stuff. You know, you heard his voice and his voice meant something. When it came on the radio, uh, you know, it was almost comforting in a sense that, that you could listen to him or you could watch him or you could hear what, you know, he had to say or how he was going to announce these games. So. I guess like in extracurricular activities, you know, when I would meet people from other areas and yeah, they would always, you know, want to talk about it and be impressed and, um, you know, as us, it was just kind of like, that's just how it is, you know. But are you aware of the fact that we've been sitting here now for five minutes and you haven't said anything? <laughs> no, it's really been five minutes. <laughs> Where is the time? <laughs> While this clip may bring laughter to some, it brings other feelings for Frateri. There, there was a great deal of criticism on KDKA and on talk shows about how bad Milo and Lanny were. And I had to, I had to try to tune that out. There was a time in my career when the guy that was, a guy named Bill Craig, who was the, was the, the general manager of the TV operation, I didn't work for him. But he came out in the newspaper and he criticized me. He called me, he called me vanilla. He called me a graduate of the Ted Knight School of Broadcasting, Ted Knight being a character from the Mary Tyler Moe Show. And he just ripped, ripped me to shreds in the public. And, and I was, you know, I was um, <laughs> quite angry about it because I, I was, I didn't work for this guy, but I was, I was one of his announcers on his TV operation. And so it didn't matter who followed the gunner, Bob Prince. He, he really wasn't going to have much of a chance. But to, to Lanny's credit, he worked through that early struggle period. And, you know, I'm a perfect example because I was of the age where, and it's blasphemy to say, you know, who's your favorite broadcaster? I'm old enough to have heard Bob Prince. And for someone like me, not to automatically say, well, my favorite broadcaster, of course, with Bob Prince. Again, it's blasphemy, but it wasn't. I didn't care for Bob Prince. He wasn't my cup of tea. My cup of tea was Lanny Terry. While Terry dealt with his critics, the family was enjoying one of their best seasons in franchise history. Even though the Pirates finished off that season with a title, Lanny did not. In 1979, Major League Baseball decided that the local announcers were not going to announce the games. And it was very frustrating to be with the team all year long. We did the playoffs against the Cincinnati Red, but we were not allowed to do the World Series. And not only were we not allowed to do the World Series, but Milo and I were not allowed to sit in the seats that we sat in throughout the whole regular season because the baseball writers took our booth away from us. So keep in mind that when we got to 90, 91, 92, when we got to those three playoffs under Jim Leland, and particularly in 1992, when it looked like we had won game seven in 92, um, what was going through my mind each year, and particularly in 92, was I'm on my way to announce, because we were gonna be allowed to do the World Series in 90, 91, 92. So it's one of my major regrets, never having a chance to say, you know, welcome to the 1992 World Series. Never had a chance to do that. What Lanny could do was something Bob Prince taught him when he started, make his name known in the Pittsburgh community. That Bob encouraged me to, to get out and, and meet uh, my audience. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time, as a matter of fact, during many of my, during most of my years, uh, I would average some 35 to 40 appearances during the winter. He recognized that this was, you know, not only a, a job for him, but also his dream. And I think he understood that, you know, it was his job to go out and, uh, you know, kind of lift the spirits of the team as well as the, the community and the city 
uh, even when they weren't doing so well. Yeah, I remember it, it was it's, it was really important to him to like live in the community that he was an announcer in. I know from not only when I was a pirate broadcaster, the letters I would get from people uh, uh, talking to me about about listening to the games and what they enjoyed about my broadcast, but also since I left the Pirates, that 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 same I, I'm amazed the number of letters I get still to this day from people, is, you know, and I'm I'm most gratified that they're they're very positive letters how they enjoyed listening to me and. Uh, and, and enjoyed sharing their baseball memories with me. But it wasn't a call or a game that stood out most in for Terry's unforgettable career. The most important development about my career, the thing that means the most to me about my 33 years of Pirate Broadcaster, the thing that stands out that I cherish the most from my 33 years is my friendship with Jim Leland. Thank you again for doing this. Um, so, how did you first meet Lanny? Well, Lanny and I uh, first met in 1986, the, 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 the winter of 1986, when I became the, the pirate manager. And Lanny was uh, obviously the broadcaster at the time and the voice of the Bucks. And uh, we had the winter caravan that year. That was my first year. And Lanny uh, was in charge of the winter caravan and was the basically the MC on every, all the stops that we made. And so we got acquainted, uh, you know, we weren't really obviously close at the time. I really didn't know Lanny that well. He didn't know me. I was a new manager and for me, he was a, a broadcaster. And uh, so we, you know, developed a little bit of a relationship that winter going into spring training. And that's how it all started. When Jimmy became the pirate manager, the first two years he was there, I didn't think he liked me. And we really didn't have much connection. I would ask him questions and he would answer them, etc. And then at one point, after he'd been a pirate manager for a couple of years, th there, was, there was a day, a night in New York, we came back from Shea Stadium and we got to the hotel and I heard Jimmy say, Lanny, and I said, yeah, Skip. He goes, I want you to come up to my suite tonight. Well, you know, I, know I think it's really important for a manager and a broadcaster to have some type of rapport because you're going to be working with them pretty much every day. In most cases, uh, you're going to have a, a radio show at some point uh, where you're discussing at that time uh, what's going on with the Buckos. I thought that was really important. I thought it was really important to keep your broadcaster as well informed as you could on the day-to-day -day operations. And I said to him, I said, Jimmy, I shouldn't be here. You know, you're because you, they started talking about players and making trades and I said Jimmy I shouldn't be here and he said I trust you that I wanted to tell the people what was going on with the pirates what I was thinking on a daily basis is if they wanted to question a move you make or you talk about some strategy and and Lanny was really good at that he was always prepared he always had good questions and we talked about it and we and we got the word out to the pirate fans because I think it makes them feel more of a part of the team and that friendship, that relationship, Jimmy sharing things with me, telling me what I could use in, on the air and what I couldn't use on the air. He, you know, he went to management, said, I want Landy to do my, my radio show with me. Um, and, and we spent a great deal of time together, uh, J Jimmy and, and Gene Lamont and Ken Biggerstaff, the trainer of the ball club. We played golf together all the time. Um, nobody nobody be, besides a family member has done more for me. Um, than, than Jim Leland. So we had that trust in Lanny, and I think that really worked to his advantage and our advantage as well, and, and the advantage of the Buckos at the time. Because like I said, I, I, think it's, I think it's smart to get the information out what's going on with the team. I think that's very important for your fans. He's just a remarkable guy. Everybody should have a friend like Jim Leland. He's, he's a caring individual. He comes off as a gruff individual. Um, um, there, there's nothing phony about the man. He's very blunt. Uh, that's what I loved about him. I love the fact that he's not afraid to, to, uh, to, to be blunt and, and honest with you as a friend. You know, during the course of all this stuff, the games and the road trips and everything else, Lanny and I played golf once in a while with the coaches. And, uh, you know, we included Lanny a lot. And, uh, you know, and, and we became, uh, you know, best of friends. There's no question about that. Uh, Lanny ended up being the godfather to my, my son, Patrick. Uh, you know, we've been friends for some almost 35 years now, so and still are to this day. When uh, Jim and Katie 
were expecting Patrick, they asked me if I'd be the godfather. What, what a great honor that Jim and Katie should think enough of me to ask me to be their godfather for Patrick. Lanny for Terry, I, I don't know if people really understand this or not, what a gem they had here. Lanny for Terry, in my opinion, could have gone national. He had one of the great voices of all time for baseball, one of the best baseball announcers I've ever heard. Uh, he was absolutely terrific, and I think he undersold himself, to be honest with you. Um, Liz and I and Jim and Katie, we went to have dinner in Fox Chapel with Mark and Georgia Sauer. Mark Sauer was, at that time, the president of the Pirates. And as we were driving um, to the restaurant, um, Jimmy said to me, how much do you make? Um, which didn't, didn't shock me because I said, Jimmy's a very blunt individual. And, and, and I told him, I told him what I made. And so we get to the restaurant and after, after about sitting there for 35, 40 minutes, the, the pleasantries, Jimmy turns to Mark Sauer and he says, Lanny's underpaid. He needs a raise. And I was, you know, I was shocked. I was like, oh my God, what, you know, what has Jimmy done here? You know, in front of the boss, he's telling him, Lanny needs to get a raise, right? So the night went on. Monday morning, I get a call from Mark Sauer. Come on in, I want to talk to you about your contract. How about that for a friend? Ball hit well down the left field line. Brian Giles to the corner. Brian is at the wall, jumps up, and he makes the catch at the fence right near the foul pole. Brian Giles robbing Brandon Phillips of a home run. It's the second out of the eighth. So, just how good is Lanny? But Lanny for Terry was one of the great baseball voices of all time and probably doesn't get the credit for that because you think of the Scullies and people like that. <laughs> Harry carries the guy. Lanny for Terry was as good as anybody. He was terrific. The Pirates have scored three here in the bottom of the night. The Bucks have the tying run at first base. And a one ball pitch. Giles swings, drive to right field. Buckos win by way of a grand slam. Brian Giles, a line drive, grand slam into the right field seats. Count them. Six, seven, eight. Giles makes nine. Bucks win. Nine, eight. There was no doubt about it. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating here. <laughs> there, uh, uh, let's put it this way. A week doesn't go by. I won't say every single game, but a week doesn't go by during the course of my broadcast moments that I don't think about Lanny in some way. The Jackie Robinson night on a Saturday night with a sellout crowd, they pitched a no-hitter and went into the 10th inning and Mark Smith came up. Time Steve and I have talked about it, you know, off the air together, that it's one of the greatest calls and so simplistic. No-hitter, home run, you got it all. This game, 10th inning, oh, one pitch drive, deep left field, no-hitter, home run. Uh, I was just at the end of my college experience. I was just coming out of college. Um, I missed a lot of, you know, what probably was going on at the time at home uh, because I was away at college and it kind of hit me as a shock. You were there if somebody wanted to open up to you, you're there for them, but at the same time, you're not going to pry. So that's the way I always left it. It's one thing about Lanny, <laughs> he's, a, he's pretty much an open book. It's hard because you don't always know how to help them. In the late 1990s, Lanny's life would take a turn that would change him and his family forever. When I realized that I was getting a divorce um, in the late 90s, uh, I called Jim and I told him that, that I was getting a divorce. And he said, where are you going to live? And I said, well, I'm going to get an apartment. And he said, no, you're not. You're going, to live with, you're going to live with us. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, I have an apartment above our garage, and Katie and I want you to come and live over our apartment. It was my last year in high school. My dad had moved into Leland's carriage house in Mount Lebanon. And I heard from a bunch of the guys in my math class who were uh, valets and atrios 
that my dad was there a lot and hanging out there a lot. Um, so I decided to work there. So I got a job at Atria so I could just kind of, you know, keep an eye on him a little bit. One day after a Friday night game where I know he was he was having a tough time, I went over to his house and, and just sat down and talked to him. Uh, I don't think we remedied anything, but I think uh, he, he appreciated that gesture. W without diving too deep and going places we shouldn't, um, but but I hope he knows we supported him. But but it's not like he tried to hide things. Lanny's not like that. The main talk when I was younger and they would talk about him was the, always the divorce or the constant like different lady, different girl every year or two or whatever it was. I didn't know what that was when I was that young. I'm sure they didn't want me to know. That's a real fine line there, a little fine edge. You know, you don't want to pry into somebody's personal business, certainly, but you want to be there to support for somebody. And that's basically all that was. Uh, Lanny was going through a tough period, and, you know, a, as a friend, I think those are the things you do. I think it was as simple as that. The apartment was, was perfect for me. It had a little sitting room, a little kitchenette, a bathroom, and a bedroom. That's all I needed. And, uh, and uh, pretty much every night, Katie or Jim would call and say, come on down to dinner, and um, uh, it was, it was, uh, you know, I had, I had someone to, uh, I could spend time talking to Katie and Jim about what I was going through with the divorce and how I felt about that, and and uh, and that was the winter, you know, it was during the winter months, and so I, I, I just, as I said, I can't, I can't thank the Jim and Katie enough for, for all that all they've done for me. However, just as one issue seemed to settle, another arose. Uh, it was a surprise at first because. Again, I had always known him as this loving, like, compassionate, outgoing guy. And I would never have guessed that he had a drinking problem. Like, I would never have guessed that. The alcoholism, I believe, uh, became a product of my job. Uh, it became a product of being on the road so much, having so much free time, unfortunately getting in my head that uh, having a couple cocktails after games was a reward for having done the job well. He, he just wanted the buckos to do so good, so bad, that I think it, it sometimes it affected him. He was depressed. He was going through the motions, um, but so mindset like nothing had changed, you know. I have to, I have to wind down. If I'd get back from the ballpark at 11 o'clock at night, I, I'd need a couple of hours to unwind. And so, unfortunately, I fell in the habit of when I was unwinding on my back porch or unwinding after games on the road. It was with a cocktail in my hand, um, and then it just it just continued to, to spiral. And Obviously, when you're working and devoting your attention to in your life to an organization, you know, a loss to kind of take that hard sometimes. I never liked being out on that limb, uh, you know, feeling like I was out there on the limb by myself. I don't want my students to feel that way. I don't want my my kids, my grandchildren, my children to feel that way. I moved back to Pittsburgh in 2007. It just seemed like a good idea, you know, to move in. You know, just kind of keep an eye on him. You know, when he was drinking a lot, um, I was drinking with him. You know, I was like, oh, this is great. This is fun. Like, my friends come over. Um, and then I realized that it wasn't so great and it wasn't so fun. Um, I was, you know, busy with work. I mean, I had kids by then. Um, and so, you know, I had my own things going on. My sister had her things that she was dealing with. So I don't know if we really at the time were as supportive as we probably could have been as, as children. But, I mean, he didn't take long to obviously find another role or find another you know, niche in life that, or, or his calling. Typical Lanny, he still remembered his obligation to the community and himself when it came time to put on the headset. It was incredible. And I don't know how uh, many people are able to do this. I can't do it. But I'll tell you right now, when that light goes on in that radio booth or in that TV booth, bang, it is over. Whatever you were just talking about with him, whatever personal struggles he might be going through, um, he knew he had a professional job to do, and he did it, as well as anybody, to this day. My wife and I both, my, my entire family, and, and a lot of other people that we knew were, uh, Lanny's got a lot of friends in Pittsburgh, and I think a lot of people, it wasn't just the Lelands, it was a lot of people that were there for Lanny during the times. You know, once we were able to get him some help, 
and kind of tackle it as a family, um, you know, it was a good thing. The main reason that I want to be sober, the main reason that I want to not drink, is because I've always told my children and my grandchildren that I will always be there for them. That no matter when or where they need me, two o'clock in the morning, whenever, they call me, I'm there for them. And the scary thing is that when I was drinking, I wasn't, I wouldn't have been able to be there for them. Did you want to retire in 2008? No. Frank said to me that, first of all, congratulated me for the professional that I was and the job I did. And, but then he said, I think it's time for you to step aside. Um, he told me that, um, he, he said, we have two press releases. Um, and I only read one. I only read the one where it said I'm retiring. Uh, to this day, I wish I'd read the other one. At the end of the 2008 season, Lanny Frateri's 33-year Pirates career was over. He and the organization mutually agreed to part ways. You know, I guess I wonder where there's some things that they thought I was doing or, was, you know, was my alcoholism. Uh, it, I never felt it affected the, affected the job I did on the air, but I've always wondered where there are things about, uh, about Frank and the Pirates deciding that I should step aside, you know, were the things in that other press release that uh, I, I wasn't exposed to. He was, he was pretty sad, he was pretty tore up. It was a pretty difficult time for him. Without knowing a lot of the details, I thought he was ready. I look at that as a part of the business. It was a sad thing because sometimes uh, when people are there for so long, it hurts people, you know, not to, not to come back or not to go back. But, you know, I'm one of those guys that I'm able to turn the page. I, I understand that type of stuff and uh, I just move forward. Yeah, I, I learned really at the very end of the season that he was not coming back and called him right away and I congratulated him and said, I think, you know, it's going to work out great for you. Um, uh, I think this, if this is what you want, that's great. And uh, I still think you're an incredible broadcaster and if you change your mind someday, <laughs> it would be tremendous. I, I wasn't happy about it personally. I was torn in that I didn't want him to go but if it made him happy and that's what he wanted, then, then I'd be happy for it. And I, I feel a little bit bad too because, it, you know, there was, um, I'm, and I learned this from Jimmy, by the way, it's, it's far better to deal honestly with people. And, uh, um, you know, I, I bought into the program that Lanny's retired and, and that's so I misled a lot of people in that regard. At the meeting, Frank said, we want to have a day for you. And I said, no, I'm, I, I don't, I, I'm not up for that. And, uh, and I was wrong. I should have. I should have accepted his, his generous offer uh, to, to have a day for me. Um, and, you know, I was, I, I've always been uh, disappointed that, that, that I haven't had a more consistent relationship with the ball club since I, since I left. Jim Render who uh, has won 406 games in his career, five WPIAL championships, two state titles, 23 conference championships. And at the end of the 2018 season... Well, sure. Another one of Lanny's good friends is former Upper St. Clair head coach and WPIAL football legend Jim Render. The 400-plus game winner almost altered Lanny's life completely. Because of my friendship with Jim Render, um, when, when I stepped aside from the ball club, I, I did have a conversation with, with Jim. Uh, I asked him about that job and, you know, he gave me some encouragement, though um, he knew how tough a job it would be, uh, how tough being an athletic director is, the hours that you put in. Um, but I did, I did talk to the superintendent of schools at Upper St. Clair. Um, and was led to believe that I might be a strong candidate for the job. 
and I kept waiting for the job to be posted in the newspaper. And then finally it was on March the 1st of 2009. And the reason it was fortuitous was that right next to the Upper St. Clair ad looking for a new athletic director was the ad for Waynesburg University. I put my resume together, looked on the internet, uh, threw it, sent out three letters, one to Human Resources, Tom Helmick, one to the president of Waynesburg University, and, one, and then I looked up the name of the chairman of the department and sent one to, to Richard Krause. The broadcast program before, we had very competent people who were, who were leading it or working in it. Um, we had a component of sports announcing that was included in it, but it was more the technical end of it. We didn't have the number of courses that we do now. I was concerned that if I sent just one letter to Human Resources, because the ad said you had to have a master's degree and you had to have teaching experience, I didn't have either. So I knew that if I sent, or I was quite confident or thought that if I sent my resume just to HR, um, I'd be pushed aside. So I sent out three letters. And that was the really cool part of it. He was actually looking to possibly get into athletic administration in some way. And I don't think he was sure. And then he saw the announcement uh, for the ad uh, for the position here at Waynesburg. Waynesburg University looking for a professor, someone to teach in the communication department, to be advisor to the radio station. And, um, and I, know, I knew it was God's message to me, this is, this is what you should do. In April of 2009, Lanny Frateri was hired as a professor of communication at Waynesburg University. When you first got here, how hard was it to learn how to become a professor? Oh. Well, well first I was fortunate that I said to myself, look, don't, don't just assume because you know a lot about broadcasting that that makes you a great teacher or that can make you even a fair, effective teacher. I said, you, you've got to learn uh, I mean, uh, it, let me think about that. It, it, when, when former athletes became broadcasters, I was somewhat watching to see whether they would appreciate what it would take to be a good broadcaster. You know, did they just think because they were baseball players, they now could become broadcasters? And the ones that survived a period of time were the ones that understood that this was, uh, that there was more to this job than might originally appear to be. Uh, but and I took that same approach with, I'm not going to step in and, and believe that I can just teach no questions asked. That would be an insult to those individuals that had spent years upon years preparing to be teachers. Well, here's the way to solve it. Each team is still looking for its first win. And just like that, Lanny Terry was college professor scorecards and autographs traded for lesson plans and grades. The adjustment may have been hard for Frateri, but to his peers, there seemed to be no doubt that he was going to knock this new journey out of the park. If I had ever had the opportunity to take a class, a broadcasting class, where Lanny Frateri was teaching me broadcasting, I would have jumped at that chance. I, I think young people who are fortunate enough to be in that class will find, if they don't already know, find out down the road, once they're in that job or some other job, how valuable that was. Yeah, I think he realized that, you know, he had a lot more to give and I think he saw an opportunity in Waynesburg to, you know, give back in, in the best possible way in terms of, you know, his career in communications and sports broadcast. He loves it so much. It's awesome to watch him thrive. It's awesome to watch him buy everything orange, like a car, and his shirts, all of his clothing, like he's so into Waynesburg. I know that they were, you know, Waynesburg was getting somebody that was, that there was gonna be nobody that was more dedicated than Lanny Fateri. Anything that Lanny Fateri did, he, he went in full bore. I mean, he didn't half step it. He went in and he was going to do the job. He was going to be prepared for that just like he did when he was a broadcaster for the Pirates. It was perfect. I was thrilled for him. I, and I, I knew right away because he's a teacher at heart. I mean, he just, he loves, again, the way he guided me along the way. He loved that. In my early years, first of all, I had it in my head initially that I had to lecture the whole time. And so there was great pressure on me 
to how do I put together every semester there's 30 classes how do I put together 30 hours of lectures and and fortunately I learned that that, that, that what would what would serve me well but more important to the, to the equation what would serve my students well would be some form of of philosophy to them and then the kickback from them as to how they felt about it, what, what they were thinking about the process, how they were thinking as they were evolving as broadcasters. So one of my clients was in his first class. Um, and we're friends, you know, she, we had mutual friends and it also happened that she was in my dad's first class. And, um, you know, I was asking, I was like, What's, what was he like as a teacher? And she's like, oh, he was an easy A. It was his first semester though, so I will say that. That, that was the ticket for me to go to Waynesburg, uh, and it was the gateway to so many other things. I mean, I've been in broadcasting professionally now since, if you count part-time stuff, 2013 when I worked for WJPA. Uh, I've been doing this for several years now professionally. I love it, uh, and it's very, very, very possible that none of it ever would have happened. We only had three classes with them because of how the curriculum was shaped. So it was sports announcing one, two, and then the regular announcing class. And I thought all three classes were different, which was a good thing. He was still fairly new. I mean, he wasn't brand new when I got to Waynesburger, but he was still fairly new to teaching. And I, I think that's something I couldn't go and do it right now. I couldn't step into a classroom and, and go through 15 weeks of a semester, whether that's in, in these times on Zoom or, or wherever in, in a physical classroom, I, I couldn't do it. Preparation, being yourself, and just having fun with it. You're sp it it's something that we're passionate about. And so and you, can't be, you can't be stressed all the time about putting the headset on and broadcasting. It's, I know, what I'm, I know that I'm gonna have fun doing this because that's why I'm doing it. So I knew that Lanny had more experience than anybody was going to teach us. And that's always the way I felt. You know, I was asked a lot uh, by, you know, friends and family, how is Lanny as a teacher? You know, he never taught before, so how is he in the classroom? And my quick explanation would just be, well, yeah, you know, he never had teaching experience before he came to Waynesburg, but there's nobody out there, especially around here, that's going to teach better than Lanny for Terry. I think that the, the thing though that stands out to me about Lanny as a teacher is the fundamentals. The way that he hammers home the bare basics of broadcasting. Um, he's an insanely good broadcaster. He's an insanely good broadcaster. But the reason he's so good, he has the voice for it, he has the experience, but he had to start somewhere, right? And it started with the fundamentals. Like most new voyages, there are treacherous waters. Lanny's care for his students' success could come off in the wrong way, in critique sessions over grades and broadcasts. Lanny was not afraid to tell his students his thoughts on their performance, good or bad. Because I care about them, there's nothing wrong with me raising my voice. And, and, and if other, here's the thing too, if other students hear that, I, I'm not, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's wrong necessarily. You know what, if he yells, it's probably deserved. Or if he raises his voice or gets kind of fiery, it was never an issue to me. And I think uh, it probably is a little bit different for everybody because everybody's different when they take that kind of critique. But uh, go in there with some thick skin and, and kind of wear it a little bit and, and get better from it. I think that's why he does it. He does it because he cares. In the end, he, he, the, way, the way that he acts in those meetings and the way that he kind of critiques is, is because he cares. He's not going to blow smoke. He's not going to tell you you did a great job if you didn't do a great job. Uh, and I think in the end, I think that's more beneficial for you than to have uh, basically fake stuff thrown at you and say you were great, but meanwhile, you weren't actually that good. I was, I was happy with it in the end because it certainly made me a better broadcaster. Uh, Lanny's critiques, like you said, showed me how much he cared uh, and how much he thought of me down the line. And I remember him also telling me later on uh, in my Waynesburg career that early in my early stages, maybe due to the fact that I wasn't as involved my freshman year because of playing football, uh, he said I showed a tremendous amount of improvement that he honestly didn't see coming. 
While the students got used to Lanny's teaching style, Lanny was appreciating his new opportunity to interact with today's youth. I have met so many remarkable young people. I get mad when I'm with a group of people that take shots and make some comment about, you know, millenniums today or, or young people today. I get so mad because the large percentage of young people that I've met at Waynesburg University are not only young people that are, that are thoughtful and, and caring and have a basis to their lives and many of them uh, have, a, have a faith that, that, that I respect greatly and at times envy that their faith in God is uh, even stronger than, than mine, but th this, is a, this is a place that nurtures um, th that, that type of caring attitude. I don't want to say that it surprised me because it would make it out to seem like that I wasn't expecting him to be as caring and as passionate as he was. I, I certainly anticipated that, that's why I came here. But my expectations were blown out of the water. Let's say we take a test on it in his class and we get 100% on it. He doesn't want us to, after we take the test, just completely forget everything that was on the test. And I remember him saying this the first day of class that he wants us to retain information and just because he took a test on it, you can forget about it. I'm gonna do something that Lanny usually is against and use a cliche, but knowledge is power. And I truly believe that. Um, people that are more knowledgeable and are able to hold conversations and dive deep into topics and subjects, Lanny's one of those people and you can tell. I worry a lot because, because when you care about students and you want to see them live their dreams, number one, are you doing the right thing to put them on the right path? And number two, because how difficult it is to be successful in broadcasting, um, you know, what, what, what happens after they leave Waynesburg and, and how, how successful, how much do they have an opportunity to, to realize their dreams and do what they want to do? You know, the stories you hear of how things shook out with him and the Pirates, you fully anticipate based on how things might have ended and the stuff that he's had to go through, call it quits and enjoy retirement. But here he comes down to Waynesburg to start, it is, it's a second career because of the time he's put in and the effort that he's put in. And not once in my gonna be four years here do I question um, his work ethic. Have I questioned his will to be here? Have I questioned his care? It's as strong as the day I met him. I'm only here as a professor at Waynesburg two days a week, but I'm a seven day professor. You know, I think that the thing about Lanny that's most striking is how much he cares, how much he wants to be invested in what you're doing from the day that he meets you. Lanny was like a father to me whenever it came to being on campus. I mean, he would call me, he would text me if I needed anything. If I called him, he would answer. Is always honest, uh, and I think that goes a lot with his teaching. You know, anytime you have a sit down with him and he goes over a broadcast, if you didn't have a good one, he's going to tell you you didn't have a good one and he's going to point out every single reason why and if you do impress him he'll he will say you impress him yeah i think he taught us a lot and, and taught me a lot for sure and i've taken a lot of what he taught us to to heart and have used that he's lived it he's seen it firsthand he's had ups he's had downs he's been able to collect all those experiences and now pass down that knowledge that wisdom to other people and especially young broadcasters I'm, I'm glad every day and I'm thankful every day that I became one of his students because I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Close your eyes. Think of your childhood hero. What did they do for a living? Now think about doing that job alongside them. Now watch this. Hi friends and a very pleasant good evening. Uh, the former Plum Mustang and uh, a member of the Waynesburg University Broadcasters Hall of Fame, Kyle <laughs> Dawson alongside. 
What are your thoughts about this one? Getting on air with him for the first time is, is a big memory for me. And uh, those were always really cool for me because at least the first time around, and it's, it's kind of become working with a friend now, but at, at least in the first time, I'm like, wow, I'm stepping on the air. I'm putting on a headset with a guy that I grew up watching, that I grew up listening to, that I idolize as a mentor, that I am now getting to work with as a mentor, but I'm going on air with him. With the help of the Trib Live High School Sports Network, students such as Mitch and Alex can work not just alongside each other, but with Lanny, directly covering high school sports. When, when I work with students, when I work with Waynesburg students, I must admit two things happen to me. One, I'm, 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 I'm proud to sit alongside of them and hoping that they're proud to sit alongside of me. It was one of the most horrifying terrifying, thrilling, worst, best experiences of my life. And we had a championship game at the Peterson Event Center, and right away he got his note cards, he got his spotter board, and we went into the tunnel where the players come from. They got off the bus. He said, Coach, when you have a minute, I want to talk to you. He grabbed him immediately. And for me, whenever I was an announcer, I was more passive. I was like, I'll wait for him to come to me, and I don't want him to think that I'm going to like come to him and bother him. But Lanny went right to him, and of course, the, it's Lanny. Like, the guy's not going to get mad for a guy like me. He looks at me and goes, yeah, I'll get to you when I get to you. But, you know, Lanny has an agenda. You know what it is. He gets right to the point, and he knows exactly what he wants to do, what exactly he needs to talk to those, these people about. He's prepared about what he wants to ask them. Intense, but a really cool feeling, because how many people can say that they got to work side by side with their mentor, uh, with their professor, with the, the man that taught them? pretty much everything they know in terms of broadcasting. But also there are times when I get, I, I get frustrated because I'm hearing them th do things that um, I wish they wouldn't do, but I can't correct them, you know, I can't correct them on the air. I can't, I can't deal with an issue that I think is, you know, that, that I would recommend to a student. And in some cases I tell them later, hey, this is what I think you should have done in that situation, or here's, here's how you should have approached your preparation or, or whatever. For a lot of students, the opportunity to work with Lanny wouldn't have happened if it weren't for five days every June since 2010. Uh, the camp came about because um, the, the, the CSI uh, camp was already in effect um, from the um, uh, criminal Justice Department and uh, uh, Professor Krauss said to me in 2009, would you think we could put a camp together? Well, the camp is by far our number one recruiting activity. So based on the data, the people who actually come to the camp, how many actually enroll at Waynesboro University, uh, it is by far our best recruiting project or event. And I was a part of the first ever camp. So it was a brand new thing, a uh, lot of radio advertisements, you heard Lanny promoting it uh, on the local Pittsburgh radio stations. Uh, my mom and dad heard about it, asked me if I would be interested in it, and so we looked into it. And then one day before the camp started, we get a phone call while we're all at the store from Lanny Frateri. So he leaves a voicemail on my parents' answering machine. And I mean, my mom was freaking out about it. Lanny Frateri is on our voicemail, Nick. And you know, he's saying, we've got a spot for you. If you want to come to the sports announcing camp, you can. And so that was my first ever interaction with Lanny. It was through a phone call that ended up being a voicemail that may or may not still be saved on my mom's answering machine. But the night when I was a camper and we came here, I think I had the first two innings of the game. I had never called baseball play-by-play -play to that point. Obviously, I had grown up watching it. I had grown up listening to it. So I kind of had an idea of where I would want to go with it. Um, but I had never actually called baseball before the baseball uh, game that we called here at Wild the Wild Things uh, for the camp. I met Doug Wilson. I met Brandon Zeminski. I met Richard Krause. And once I transferred to Waynesburg, it was like, oh, I know these people because I was at the camp. And maybe they didn't remember me right away because there were a lot of kids and they'd done this every year. But 
For me, it was, hey, I know Doug Wilson. He was at the camp. This is not my radio professor. Hey, I know Richard Krauss, chairman of the department. Hey, I know Brandon Zeminski. He was my first teacher I had whenever I transferred into Waynesburg, and he worked the camp. Of course, I know who Lanny was. So that was helpful for me just because, you know, I got to learn who people were and meet them. For me, it was one of the first times that I ever got to be on the mic, that I ever got to prep for a baseball broadcast, that I ever got to interview people on and have it be recorded on camera. All of those things, it was just so exciting for me. You know, it was so exciting. And to get to do it with the guy you grew up listening to on Pirates play-by-play, -play, I mean, as a high school senior, that was just out of this world. Felt that we needed time, I needed time to put this together. Um, and so I'm glad we waited till 2010. And uh, I remember that, that first day, uh, of our first camp in 2010, I was really worried. You know, here I was with 25 to 28 high school students that I was responsible for, and you know, was it going to be a beneficial week for them? Was this going to uh, be something that uh, they would enjoy? Were we going to have fun? That week was probably one of the most fun weeks, honestly, in my life. One of the first things that I've ever ever did with Lanny for Terry was beat him at cornhole. We, we won the cornhole tournament uh, at the first sports announcing camp. The camp was so much fun. It was such a great experience. And I think that it was just so influential, not just for me, but for a lot of kids who wanted to pursue broadcasting as a career. From the binders to the folders, the name tags, so much attention to detail. And throughout that week, I got to know Lanny. Uh, we had a couple conversations, some critique sessions, and I could tell how much he cared, not only about broadcasting, but also about Waynesburg University and what it meant to him to have an opportunity to teach students here. When I was in high school, there was, I couldn't really find anyone who was looking for the same major as me. And when I went to this camp, I was nervous, and then I got there and almost everyone was like, was as interested in this stuff as me and acted like me and just wanted the same thing as me. All kinds of memories, uh, all kinds of moments, you know, moments when we're working with students and we have some uh, very prominent guests on campus who participate in the camp, uh, but at the same time, some real down moments where, you know, that bond that you hope to see within the department is revealed. And I'm, I'm extremely proud of what we've done with our sports announcing camp over the years. So when I say the name Lanny Frateri, what comes to your mind? I'm not, I'm not afraid if, if people know that I'm an insecure individual, but I hope they also know that, that um, I'm, I'm a caring, uh, I, love, I love to believe I'm a caring person and, um, and, that, um, and that I'm authentic. cares and is generous with his time uh, and someone who recognizes the importance of you know being a good role model and putting uh, the best possible you know image of yourself out there I think him being in the public eye molded him into the person that he is today and uh, you know he's a great father he's a great grandfather uh, he's, and he's a great professor and, and a great you know a great human being pops. It's so fun seeing him as a grandfather. You know, just the just the visions of him playing with my son and just watching the two of them. Like that's what I see now. You know, Pirates broadcaster who would do anything for anyone, just no matter if they're family or not. I always had a great respect for uh, people that really did their job well, and, and people that really cared about their job, were very thorough about their job, and. You know, I had a great respect for that, and Lanny was one of those guys. Huge heart, he cares so much about everyone, every single person. Caring, uh, one of the hardest working people at his craft I've ever met. An example uh, for me to this day, uh, and a friend. Thanks for helping me get involved in this business. Thanks for being a friend for 23 years. Uh, thanks for teaching me. and. Uh, Lenny, if I had a vote, you'd be in Cooperstown. It is absolutely incredible to think that Lanny spent 33 years at the highest level working one of the most coveted jobs 
and one of the hardest to break into industries that there is. He was a Major League Baseball play-by-play -play announcer for a long, long time and was extremely, extremely good at it and respected for how good he was at his job. And then when he entered the next phase of his career, he decided that he was gonna give young people the opportunity to try to do what he did, to try to chase that goal, to try to live that dream just like he did. What Lanny was able to do is simply amazing. Uh, it's just been amazing that he acclimated so quickly. He's achieved so much. Uh, I will tell you point blank, he doesn't realize how much he's achieved here. It's hard for me, it's, it's legitimately hard for me to put into words how much Lanny has meant to me and my career and I, I probably would have to say that because I don't, I don't know that I truly could uh, do it justice, if that makes sense, to, to what he's done for me. For the great teaching that he gave me and you know, without him I probably would not have gotten any of the uh, broadcasting gigs that I've gotten, whether that be with uh, Trib Live or you know, with the West Virginia Black Bears or you know, even the job at 93.7 The Fan. A great human being with a great heart and a passionate uh, a passionate broadcaster who uh, really wants to do the very best he can. He's driven to do the very best he can when it comes to anything. Yeah, people like Lanny for Terry don't come around very often. And when they come into your life, you really have to sit and realize what you have in front of you and be how, how grateful um, you have to be that he's there. And more than anything, everything that he's taught broadcasting wise has been tremendous times a thousand. But those life lessons sometimes are just as important and you don't get that with every professor. You get that with a special type of person. That's what Lanny is. His attention to detail, his professionalism is second to none. Lanny has treasures. I mean, some broadcasters have tools, but Lanny has treasures and he shared them, and he still does, with so many young kids who aspire to do exactly what he did in their career. Thank you for all the contributions and everything you've done here. Uh, it means a great deal to the department, but I think it means even more to me personally. Thank you. Thank you. Just thank you for everything you've done for me throughout my four years here and before. Just thank you. Just thank you for always being there. And just thank you for making me who I am today, because my parents did, but I think he was also there to help me. You know, I talked before about my mom and my dad. Um, I, I guess my, my major goal in life was to always have my dad be proud of me. Um, um, I think he was, and uh, if indeed he's up there looking down on me, I hope he's, you know, proud of me. The last thing I need from you in this setting, can I get one more no doubt about it? <laughs> yeah. And there was no doubt about it.